levar os portugueses mais longe. Ser uma ponte entre Portugal e os Estados Unidos da América. Esta é a missão da Fundação Luz Americana para o Desenvolvimento. A FLAD nasceu em 1985, na sequência do Acordo das Lages, e por aqui passaram até hoje milhares de pessoas e ideias que ajudámos a transformar em realidade. Promovemos a partilha de conhecimento e experiências através de bolsas de estudo, estágios, prémios e conferências unindo os dois lados do Atlântico. Trabalhamos diretamente com a comunidade portuguesa nos Estados Unidos. Queremos contribuir para que o papel dos luso-americanos seja cada vez mais forte e para que as origens portuguesas sejam continuamente celebradas. Nesta ligação atlântica surgem, claro, os Açores. Pela sua importância geoestratégica de segurança e defesa, científica e cultural, são um ponto essencial na atividade da FLAD. Somos ciência, educação, arte e relações transatlânticas. Há 36 anos a contribuir para o desenvolvimento de Portugal e dos portugueses. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Palcos, the Embassy of Portugal, Portugal US Chamber of Commerce, and FLAD. My name is Sandra Pires, and I'm the cultural attache at the Embassy of Portugal in Washington, DC. I have here with us today um, Magda Vakil, that is also co hosting this session with me. Magda, do you want to say something? Sure. Um, thank you very much, Sandra, for your welcome. It is a great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to hold this, host this conversation with our artists, um, Portuguese American artists that have their work being exhibited on the Portuguese American Art Gallery, which is a project of the of um, Palcos, the embassy in, in DC, FLAD and the Chamber of Commerce and uh, was an initiative to um, have a platform to display this work and hold these conversations. Um, we will be, we are live streaming on Facebook. We will also have attendees on Zoom. Please feel free to place your questions to the artists in the chat box and also via Facebook. We will then uh, um, put the questions to the artists. We would love to have the audience participate and we are looking forward to a lively conversation where we yeah. learn more about our artists' work and their projects and their inspiration and process. So it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today as well with these outstanding Portuguese American artists. I have an apology from Joana Vasconcelos who could not make it to the panel due to a personal uh, emergency today. Uh, so we have here with us um, Marina Carreira, Michael de Brito, and, um, and uh, Peter Pereira. So um, uh, I would like to ask you if you can introduce yourselves, um, just so if people don't know you, they, they will you know, know more about you. Uh, should I go first or Marina? All right, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Michael de Brito. Uh, my studio is um, based in Jersey City. I'm a realist painter. Uh, my work depicts everyday moments of uh, human interaction. Um, the paintings are uh, open-ended uh, that engage the viewers uh, through composition and storytelling. Um, uh, my work is, uh, I'm currently showing in uh, Barcelona at the Figurativas exhibition, as well as the Collins Gallery uh, in Massachusetts. Hi everyone, my name is Marina Carreira. Um, I am the queer daughter of Portuguese immigrants based in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, I am also, I'm a visual artist. Uh, I work mostly with collage and paint. Um, I also am a writer, uh, a poet specifically. So um, I do work um, in, in literature as well. Um, my work tends to investigate uh, cultural spaces, um, uh, immigrant spaces, uh, family, motherhood, uh, gender, sexuality, um, and and uh, yeah, just identity. You know, uh, queer Luso-American identity. 
Hi, my name is Peter Pereira. Um, I was born in Figueira de Foz in Portugal. Um, I immigrated to the United States when I was about seven years old, and I've lived in New Bedford, Massachusetts ever since. Um, I'm a photojournalist. Uh, my work has been published pretty much in every major publication throughout the world. Um, I'm fortunate in that I get to pursue uh, subjects that are dear to my heart, uh, including documenting poverty around the world. Uh, so thank you so much for this opportunity to be part of this panel. No, thank you so much for, for accepting to be here today. And uh, so for the ones who didn't visit yet the Portuguese American Art Gallery, I would like to, to invite you to, to visit its portugueseamericanartgallery.com and you will discover outstanding artists there like the three that we have here today, but also others. We started with just a few. We launched it last year, as Magda was saying in the Palkas conference. And now we have about 17 artists already, but we are hoping to have more in the coming, in the coming months. So I would like to ask a question to all of you. Um, so how did you decide you were going to be an artist? <laughs> Don't all answer. I guess I'll answer. I mean, uh, you know, for me, it was early, early on. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Newark and uh, my dad had a hardware store and I had a, 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 someone who worked at the store who was very talented at drawing. And uh, I used to just ask him constantly to draw me pictures. And uh, at some point he decided to just tell me to do it on my own. And it just, it didn't even dawn on me that I can do those things and create on my own. And so, um, you know, once, once I saw that, that the possibilities were there to do those things on my own, that was it, the sky's the limit. So I just was so obsessed with it and just kept doing it. So um, a lot of my intro was, you know, cartoons and comic books and things like that. Um, but then it kind of grew from there, but that's kind of how I was kind of connected to it. But um, Michael, uh, then you you went and pursued um, your studies in in fine arts. Yeah, I mean, uh, I went to Parsons, ex you know, exact for comic books actually, and I, and I I did end up getting an interview with Marvel Comics uh, to do uh, like to do inking in the bullpen, and they said for me to come in, and I I brought my portfolio, and they accepted me to come to do get a job there as an inter intern. And I had a painting teacher and he said, look, you know, you can go and do those things if you want, but just take a look at this artist, go to this, go to the museum. And if that doesn't change the way you think, then, you know, go, you know, go do what you want to do. And uh, I, I went to the museum and I looked at a few painters that he had mentioned. And from that point forward, I was like, this is all I want. I just want to paint. So, yeah, but that's kind of, that's how it kind of deviated a little bit, but I think it was all, it was all meant to be. And how about you, Marina? How did you decide it? Or, or if it was a decision, maybe it was not. No, I think it was, interestingly enough, I think it was a decision. Um, I mean, I've always been um, someone that was interested in art, right? Um, in the practice of art. Um, and what art said, um, you know, art as, as commentary, as political statement. Um, I, you know, I, I think, you know, being being the daughter of, 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 of immigrants, um, you're not really you're sort of raised to think about the arts as um, something sort of um, superfluous or, or uh, you know, luxurious, um, nothing that, you know, is practical. So um, I, 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 drew, I drew and I painted, but it, it was never something I considered, um, you know, as a craft or as profession until I started um, uh, getting to know Newark artists, I'd say about 10 years ago. And one in particular, uh, Lilina Ribeiro, um, she's, a, she's also a Portuguese American artist based in Newark. Um, and I just, you, you know, she, she had a, a studio space where she exhibited work um, and she encouraged me to sort of tap into um, um, into visual arts, because like I said, I'm, I'm formally trained as a poet, um, as a writer, right? Um, so that journey just kind of led to me to start, you know, working with collage and mixed media. Um, and now I'm pursuing a doctorate in fine arts and media. So I feel like um, I'm, I'm sort of um, officially, uh, you know, doing artistic work as an artist academic. Um, but yeah, it just came from loving art. And then in, in my late twenties, deciding to, to really, um, you know, start, start creating it. Yeah. 
But you, Peter, it was different, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I can actually trace the exact moment that I became interested in photography in general. Uh, I must have been like six years old or something like that, maybe seven. And uh, my entire family has actually lived in the United States for the longest time. So I remember my dad's uh, cousin visiting us, and he, he was an avid photographer. And I remember clearly going to uh, or Castel de Montemoro Velho. And he's carrying this thing around with his bag. And he's like, oh, you want to carry this bag? But the bag, of course, is too big for me. But I saw him taking these photos. And I think that was the very first moment that the camera really, I became fascinated with the idea of capturing moments for all time. At the time, I didn't think in those terms, of course. I mean, it's too small to think that a photograph lasts forever. But that was always in the back of my mind that I would, I really like this. I, I like this machine and I like the idea that I can capture a moment. Um, but then obviously things didn't work out that way. I actually, I'm a computer engineer. I graduated in 1992 from the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Um, but there was, it was always there. It was always this, this feeling that I really want to document things. I, I want to be able to capture historical moments. Um, so it took until 1998 for me to actually switched careers long after I had already graduated as an engineer. But those few moments, those first moments of walking through the castle, and when you're a little kid, you're so influenced by these walls and like you imagine the battles and all this other stuff, but yet you can't see any of it. You see, you can't experience it because it's not happening anymore, right? And I think the idea of photographing something that you could look at it later and maybe relive it, I think that's what probably strike, what, what struck something in my head that, you know, I really like photography. And so that's how it started. That's pretty interesting stories that you have. Um, I wanted to ask you a question also to all of you, and then I will ask maybe individual questions. But uh, Marina, Michael and Peter, you have uh, similar experiences, not exactly the same, but Marina and Michael were born in the US and Peter came to the US when he was seven. But at the same time, you have very close ties, connections and relationships with Portugal. So I would like to ask you, how do you think this relationship uh, enriched, enriched you as a human being and uh, your form of art? Marina, you want to go? Good pass, Michael. Um, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, and I think it's one that I don't I don't talk about enough, certainly. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to spend almost every summer um, in Portugal uh, with my grandparents from the ages of, you know, from infancy up until I was about 18, 19 years old and even, even uh, into my 20s. And uh, having two spaces as home, having America, right, particularly New Jersey, and then having uh, Nazaré, um, Fatima, Fanyaish, sort of those areas um, as, as Uh, another home space uh, really sort of, I think, created this bicultural understanding of the world for me. Um, I, I, I learned to sort of see things from an American perspective and see things from a Portuguese perspective. And I think that really influenced the way that um, not only I create, but the way that I parent, the way that I um, approach uh, feminism, right, from sort of a global standpoint, the way that I try to understand, um, uh, you know, gender and, 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 and race and, and sort of all of the, the things we think about, right, when we think about um, constructions and society. Um, that and just being, you know, the lucky kid that, that got to, you know, play very freely um, in, you know, and ride her bike and, 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 you know, spend time at the beach and spend time at the lake, things that, you know, in my American existence, um, I was very sheltered, um, obviously, because America is a very different place, right, than Portugal. So certain freedoms were allowed. Um, so I, I got to sort of, uh, I think, have an upbringing that my, certainly my children won't, I think, be, be a lucky enough to have. And that's certainly uh, created an interest in the way that I think about women and uh, the relationships women have to their bodies, to their sexuality, to work, to family, to spirituality. Um, I think having that connection to Portugal uh, gives me a broader insight about these things. Uh, you know, for me, I think, uh, you know, my connection is, you know, 
is that Portugal is so rich visually, right? And, uh, you know, from the colors to the patterns and the textures, uh, which all, all kind of relate to the things that I'm so passionate about, right? It's like the food, the clothing, you know, the, the interiors, right? The architecture. And then, you know, you even have like the smaller things like the dishes and the pots and the tiles, right? It's all these things that like I try to put into my work because I just want to take it all in all at the same time, right? And I think that's, that's kind of how I, I kind of always perceived when I went there, right? It's this, and even here, you know, because I still think, you know, a lot of my family when, you know, when they're here, it's still, there's still parts of it. So, you know, when I'm in those spaces, it's still kind of reminiscent of what it is like in Portugal. But I think that's kind of my, my take on it. Yeah, I mean, the, the difference that I have between you two is that I was born there. And keep in mind, I was born under um, a di dictatorship at the time. Right. Um, so... I, I can clearly remember going, because I'm from a, a small town across the river Mundu, a place called Carvagala. And I remember clearly being in my, my dad's car with my mom, and we had gone over, and the revolution had just happened. And these guys jump out of the side, side of the road with these two-by-fours with nails on them, and they forced my dad to stop, because they wanted to see if he was attached to the government in some way or other. I don't know what the outcome would have been, but those moments like that have huge impact on who you eventually become in the sense of like what is interesting to you. Right. Uh, and to me, uh, we immigrated here, again, not that we were needing to immigrate, but because we had family here and the entire country went on strike. So we decided to come and visit, never with the intent of actually returning. Um, but yet, the moment I stepped on American soil, my cousins went to go get us at the airport and my name changed. Obviously, my first name cannot be Peter if I was born in Portugal. The, the idea of having a different identity the second I stepped onto a foreign soil is something that is very hard for anyone else to understand unless it happened to them. Right. My name, Peter Pereira, is not a decision that I made. I hope people understand that. I did not change my name to become more Americanized. The name was changed for me by the very people in my family. That's what my mom calls me. So the idea of all of a sudden going from a culture here to the American way of thinking, which is anything is possible. The big advantage that we have as immigrants, right? It doesn't have to be a direct immigrant like me, but your parents are immigrants themselves is the global understanding that we have. As a small country, we never think of Portugal as the world. We think of Portugal as a small country within the context of the world. So that's the way that I was always brought up. It's like, oh, by the way, your grandfather lived all these years in Angola. Your other grandfather, well, he lived in the United States. Your cousin was born in Africa. I mean, these are things that a lot of times are taken for granted by people who have never experienced that. So how does that translate into what I do? Well, it's simple, really. I see the world as my canvas in the sense that I'm not afraid of exploring. I'm always outside of my comfort zone. Everything I do is outside of my comfort zone. And that all comes from what, you know, with the original... Um, exposure that I had, even when I was five years old in South Africa, my parents tell me I would go and run and hold on to the Zulu legs uh, of the Zulu uh, tribes people. And maybe that fascination is ultimately what I today, but I think we're all linked in, in that, uh, in the sense that because we're immigrants, because we have a global uh, outlook on where we stand, I think that that creates um, you know, avenues that maybe other people wouldn't even look at. So. That's interesting. Marina, I would like to ask you a direct question. So besides being an artist, you are also an academic and a writer. Your work in, investigates gender, sexual, cultural, social identity, and it relates to urban immigrant and first generation spaces. Do you want to talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, so generally what I don't, uh, I, I guess, talk about or, or 
or communicate in my visual art, I usually do it through writing or through poetry or through teaching. Um, I'm also a women and gender studies instructor. So I talk a lot about gender, right? Um, intersectional feminism. Um, and um, in my poetry, in particularly, I talk a lot about growing up as the daughter of immigrants and um, now more recently in work, talking about what it means to be the daughter of immigrants from a very conservative, um, you know, Catholic, uh, heteronormative society and culture, uh, what it means to be a queer woman, right? Um, so uh, I think in all of my work, whether it's writing, whether it's teaching, whether it's visual art, I really try to tell the stories, um, not only my story, right, um, as, as, as this, the, you know, this American product, this, this immigrant product, um, but the stories of my foremothers, both the familiar foremothers and the, the uh, cultural foremothers, right? Um, I, for a lot of my work has been um, centered around um, my grandmother and sort of her being, um, you know, uh, growing up poor, uh, uh, rural, on a farm, you know, one of seven children uh, who wasn't allowed to go to school, right? Um, because she was, you know, born a woman, uh, she was deemed uh, that her work would be domestic, right? And her work would be centered around child rearing. So I think about all of the opportunities that she missed, um, essentially the the lives that were her, the life that was robbed her because she she was illiterate and then coming to a country uh, where she didn't know the language and couldn't write sort of the obstacles that she had to face in order to forge a life here, right? Um, and ultimately have a good life and then, you know, to be able to go back home and retire. So I think a lot about that. I think about the challenges that um, immigrant women in particular face um, and the decisions that they have to make uh, with uh, the cards they were dealt, right? Um, and in particular, when I think about her, I think about her being a woman and and um women of her time what did you know what what were they denied which was so much right um and then looking further back you know i've investigated um the sort of the lives and um i'm really interested in the 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 girl shepherds from the fatima sort of mythology right and how they were um essentially they, they were sanctified as these holy women and, and, and sort of revered, right? But really, you know, in my perspective, I look at what, what opportunities were denied them. And that was opportunity at one, a normal childhood, right? Um, and the ability to sort of lead lives of their choosing, their lives were essentially chosen for them. So I like to look at those stories, right? And I think that my interest in those stories um, are, are direct, a direct result of being um, from women that are from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I have a question though for Marina too. It's uh, more about process. Um, is, do you think you're like, because you do collage, right? Um, and I find it very hard and you do it so well. Do you think that that kind of takes, is there a reason why you've chosen that kind of process um, to, to kind of tell that story? Um, yeah, I think, well, I, I think, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, so I think what you do is super hard, right? And, and I'm sort of unable to sort of tap into that medium the way you do. Um, but I think I like to look at what's already here, right? And sort of like, it's like stories, right? I like to collect stories. Um, so I like to look at what's already here, what's already in existence, and then use that um, sometimes as a background, sometimes as the foreground for the work I'm already doing. So um, for, you know, I do use paint and, 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 and uh, spray paint and, and all sorts of different um, um, materials, but I already, I, I like to use found materials too, things that are already here to sort of build on those conversations. Cool. Thank you for those questions. So um, a question for Peter. Um, you are a renowned photographer. Uh, in case the audience doesn't know, many times you open, you look at the New York Times and the, there's a picture on the front page or you know, I, these days I get it in, in my computer, so I get to see the pictures. So, um, so you, you, you've been featured in prominent newspapers and um, magazines. You trained as a computer engineer, but what you like to do, as you've mentioned, is take photographs that bring to light those aspects of human condition, which are sometimes forgotten. Um, you capture in a picture. Um, sometimes they say a picture 
translates to a thousand words and you capture that moment, that feeling, that um, fear, or, and there's an expression there. Um, how do you deal with that? That's a, that's, a, that's a great question and one that I'm asked quite often. And I think sometimes, um, sometimes, unfortunately, what the audience forgets is that to, to capture a photograph, there has to be a photographer behind the camera and the photographer needs to be present wherever that might be. And some of those times, they're very difficult conditions. Um, as you just heard last week, uh, there were, I believe, 14 um, Americans were, uh, were taken hostage in Haiti in the exact same areas that I photographed all not that all that long ago. Um, and you go into these places and, and you, sometimes you have to ask yourself, why am I here? You know, I have a family, I have kids. Why am I here? And then the answer is always the same. I'm here because there's something happening here that I think the world needs to know about, that the world needs to see. And the advantage of photography, the advantage of painting, the advantage of art in general, it's that it's a universal language. You see, I can take a photograph of something. It can show up in a newspaper in Indonesia, and it doesn't matter what language I speak. The image tells the story. And when I go to some of these places, sometimes they're not the most um, safest places. Um, but I always go in with the idea that I have the power as a journalist to document an event that if enough people look at it, might change. Okay. I went to India and I traveled all, in the, all over India and I found out about the, the children of Jaipur. And basically, they, they're homeless. They don't know who their parents are. They're, they, they were abandoned. And they raid the trains um, that come in and out of the station. Just as the train stops, they go in. They try to find as many wa discarded water bottles as possible. They stick them in a bag. And then they'll get like a fraction of a cent per bottle. And then, unfortunately, they gamble those with each other. And then they take all that money and they end up sniffing glue. These are heartbreaking moments. Especially if you have children. I do. I have two. So to think that I have the capability of showing the world, not just myself, but I have the tools to show something to the world that could change, that piece ended up running in Harvard Magazine. And shortly thereafter, there was um, a place that was opened up to give food to these kids. I wish I could take credit for any of that, but I can tell you I did my part. And that's all we can do. You know, photojournalism is a beautiful language in the sense that you're looking at things that are just like you, just like me, except they're in completely different places, completely different conditions. But yet you have no choice but to put yourself in the subject's shoes. So, yeah, they're difficult, uh, Magda. Sometimes I, I have to ask myself why I'm here, and I do that many, many times. But I always remind myself, these photos could change the world, even if it's just a little tiny, tiny little bit. The other thing that also puzzles me, Michael, uh, Peter, sorry, um, and I think we, we talked about this uh, last year when we first met over Zoom, um, is... Um, you know, in, in sometimes you make the trip to go, something strikes your curiosity, you find a way to get there, to explore, to live with the people or in the environment that you're going to photograph. Other times we look at the newspaper and say, how did the photographer, how come it, the photographer was there at that moment yeah, to take a ask, photo? Too. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, how does that you know, happen? How much do you, you think know? of like in terms of composition and color and lighting and things like that? I mean, in these situations, I mean, I'm thinking, how do you have time to even like put that all together where you're like, all right, well, I'm going to think of rule of thirds and put the figure here. I mean, does that even come into your mind? No, and the empty actually, space and the whole, yeah, you know, yeah this, right. There's negative this, and positive this space. stuff that we know we hear photographers 
you know, the yeah. grammar of photography. I heard. Yeah, like what day. is that? The gold. The what is the golden hour too? Like, is it how we have to do the golden <laughs> hour? You know? Unfortunately, news happens twenty four hours a day, right? Yeah. Um, I think I think one of the biggest misconceptions, um, and I think something I, I'd like to touch on is that. Why do I call myself a photojournalist and not a photographer? Well, because a photojournal photojournalism is a very narrow subset of photography in general. Okay, just like you could say I'm a painter, and then someone will say, "Well, do you do watercolors? Do you do oils? What do you do?" Photojournalism operates under the idea that the photographer has no control over the subject. The photographer simply documents what he or she sees. So the question, Michael, is how do you create a photograph that has aesthetic beauty even in the most difficult of times? And the idea is basically to operate on almost on instinct in the sense that if you have a strong visual understanding of what is looks good and what doesn't look good, and how do you translate that into a photograph that happens over a fraction of a second? It's hard for me to explain. It really is. But understand that when you look at a photograph taken by a photojournalist in a scene, there's a lot of dead time before and a lot of dead time after. It's a yeah. patience thing. Right. It's no different than you're creating a painting and you put a stick in a canvas and then you decide to sit back and let it soak in. The exact same thing. Now, people also ask me, what, is, what does being an engineer have anything to do with photography? Well, actually, it has a lot to do because I think of capturing something in, in a, an engineering terms. What does that mean? What that means is I look at something and I predict what's going to happen before it does. If I sit here and I see someone walking across, if I'm up, down, left, right, how will this person relate to the rest of the subject? Yeah. See, that's, that's my engineering background where I see things as a problem. How do I resolve a problem that hasn't happened yet? Instead of standing here talking to five other photographers, why don't I just leave them alone and go on the other side of the street? You follow what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. to me, even this morning, I'm out and, and I'm looking at things and I see the sun rising and it's shimmering on the water. And I see this ginormous pier with lamps and it's all in silhouette. And then off to the left, I see three women with three, uh, 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 wheelchairs and they're pushing the three wheelchairs with little kids in it. So my first instinct is, oh wow, I know it's going to happen. If I drive up the road, the sun's going to be shimmering to the right more. And if I get up high, I dumped my car, got a ginormous lens, ran across the street, stood on top of Jersey barriers, and just literally sat there for about 10 minutes until these people came into the frame between the two light poles. That's the way it operates. It's hard sometimes to explain. No, I get you that happens in a fraction of a second is actually a process that happens over many years of developing your photographic eye. Gotcha. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by what you guys do, to be honest. I mean, well, and that's the reason why I asked, because for me, it's where I, I usually, I will work from reference like photographs and I'll ask people to take off change a shirt or change a hat only because it's not working for me rather than waiting for the moment where someone comes in and they're like perfect sometimes i felt that it's it's less of that for me so that's why i'm at, i was asking you know in your in your instance how how do you kind of navigate through that so it's interesting and, and i'll just add this real quickly is i do a lot of talks at university level and and i've done many photo conventions throughout the country and i keep on telling people the same exact thing is like listen the possibilities of nature are infinite compared to what you are able to do if you can. It seems happen. As a journalist. Yeah. yeah. The three of you almost could do like a collab. Yeah, we probably could. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. I could definitely Sorry. send you guys a photo and then you guys could, you know, do whatever you like with it. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a fantastic project, actually. Because Michael, Michael uses photography sometimes to yeah. capture yeah. moments or scenes or expressions or, you know, which then you work through to your art. You use, you use, fo photo, you use photos and sketches, right, Michael? 
Yeah, if I mean, for majority of it, it's uh, like a sketchbook, you know, so I carry around you know, uh, something like this, you know, like a, a little sketchbook. And then I just do like, you know, drawings like this, you know, and I just, I essentially just, these are all just, you know, it's, these are things that I just are in the moment, right? And so if I happen to like something within that moment, then, then I'll take photographs. And uh, what's been really nice in the last couple of years is the phones have been advancing so much that the quality of the image has been very helpful, right? Whereas before, you know, I'd have to like get an actual decent camera because you couldn't do that. And what I like about using the phone too is that it's very inconspicuous, you know? So when I'm drawing or I'm taking photographs, you know, I, I like to be in the background where people then don't kind of get so caught up with me walking around and being in their face with stuff, you know? And so it just, it just makes for more of a, a natural moment, right? So. So Michael, you, 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 say again, Magda. Take pictures of strangers. Not necessarily. I, you know, it's, it's not that I haven't. It's just for some reason, I've always found that uh, it's like when I read a book, I find that if the writer is connected to what they're writing about, you know, sometimes if it's their own story, I just feel like it's like the way I paint. Um, it's just I, I'm more connected to it. And it seems to come through better in the work if it's like that. Um, you know, because early on when I was studying, I would do you know, just different things. I did, I did a series when I was in college of people on the subway and, and I like, I find it enjoyable because it's so diverse and there's so many different people, like different types of people. Um, but it's just, I don't know. I just always felt that I was connected to more of like the people that I knew. Um, and then, you know, as I exhibited the work, so many people were just coming, you know, saying to me that they, they felt that they were part of it, you know, even though it wasn't even their family. And so that just kind of made me keep thinking about it, you know? Yeah. Michael, you have seen your paintings in very important galleries, uh, but what strikes you the most is the Portuguese get-togethers that you that you photograph and the, and that you 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 do in the sketchbook, right? Yeah. yeah. So, what are the things that come out of these get-togethers, and why do you do you capture it? Once you you told me that you, you, it's the characters. Yeah, for me, it's, I mean, it, the most is what's important is the moment, right? And so mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, and it's kind of like what Peter talks about, you know, and it's like, you try to capture, you're trying to hold on to something, right? And, you know, you can either do it through photos, you can do through, and you can do it through painting or collage or, you know, whatever the medium is. Um, but it's, again, it's telling the story for me using figures um, and the objects and then using the interior space as a backdrop, right? Or if they're outside as well too. Um, and I'm just like, I'm fascinated by the subtle characteristics of each person and then their connection to the, to the space, like the scene that they're in. So um, yeah, and I think for me, that's the best way I can describe like, you know, my work. It's very similar to Peter in some ways, right? Yeah, the, very much. the moment. Right. Yeah, that and I it's, think it's not yeah, you know, it's, I guess, you know, we're all, I guess we're all storytellers, you know, all three of us, you know, and it's something that, that, you know, we have our own ways of doing it, but again, it's, you know, it's, there's similar aspects to it. And then there's other, there's difference, but it's just, it's a way of st telling a story. Right. So. Marina, you are an art, you know, a visual, you know, you paint and you do this visual uh, arts expression, but also a writer. Um. Are these complementary? Are there? Do you choose one way of expressing yourself versus another, depending on what the theme or what the language is? Or um, well, I think art is its own language, right? And there are certain things I think that um, I can I can create, or paint, uh, or or construct, or create um, that that talk about things that I don't necessarily have a language for via poetry. Uh, through poetry, I tend to explore a lot of personal, personal subjects, right? Familial, um, um, uh, you know, identity, stuff like that. With art, I feel like I can tackle uh, bigger cultural subjects as well, um, like, uh, um, and, and, and have more of, of my, uh, think about more of my feminist ideas. Uh, for example, I have a series called Divine Feminist where I take um, the, the idea of a holy mother, right? And 
and really sort of reclaim her away from the biblical ideas of her as this virgin mother figure that's she's been reduced to and really create her as an ultimate deity right that um looks over and, and sort of protects marginalized folks whether they're um you know uh marginalized racially, whether they're mar marginalized because of their gender, because of their sexual orientation. Um, you know, I have, I have one that's called Our Lady of Me Too, which is a patron saint of, of sexual assault survivors. So I think art allows me to make um, maybe more direct political statements um, or cultural statements that in poetry, I feel it's more autobiographical. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the best way to sort of say, do they do they overlap sometimes? Yes, because I use a lot of my text in work. Um, I'll use a lot of my own work, um, you know, poetry in, in my visual work. Um, but but usually they, they sort of tackle different things. We actually have a question here in the Q&A from uh, Thomas Cucci. The question is for Michael, but others, well, all three of you. What advice would you give to your younger self if you could go back in time? And secondly, what is the hardest part of creating a painting? Uh, the advice I would give, I mean, just be patient. I think uh, when I was younger, I was just, you know, I, I, did, I wanted to paint the way that I paint now, um, but I wanted it then. And I think, you know, for me, I think just being patient and giving it time um because it, uh, it'll happen you know and so I guess that's what I would say to my younger self um and the second part was what's the most say again the most difficult what is the hardest part of creating a painting uh for me it's just getting to the canvas to be honest you know I, I have an idea then I start doing drawings and then it's the first brush stroke on the canvas is by far the hardest for me um, once I get it going, then it's, it's, I feel it's very fluid, but it's just that, that time from sketch to then first, like adding paint to the canvas like this, this would be a, like a prime example. I do a drawing and then, then finally starting to paint on it would be the most challenging because in my mind, everything has to, has to be set at a certain standard. And if it's not, then I don't even want to paint it, you know? And so that's kind of my issue that I've always had. So, yeah. Marina, you are nodding. I think like Michael, the hardest part is getting started, right? Is taking what's in here and yeah. putting it on, on, on canvas or sort of whatever, um, uh, you know, you know, whatever foundation you're, you're working in. Um, if I had to give advice to my younger self, it would definitely be to create um, and to and to believe in in your in, in myself as an artist. Um, I don't think I think I denied myself permission for a long time to do a lot of things. Um, so I definitely would go back and just say, you know, do and create. And as uh, Saul Lewitt, who's a really interesting artist, would say, make your own uncool. Right. I think as as younger artists, we're always worried about creating things that are cool and fascinating. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, uh, our, you know, our work is cool no matter what, right? As long as it's something that resonates with us. Um, I always think of myself as my own audience, right? Um, I create for me really. Uh, so, you know, I think that's the advice I would give. And um, I think, you know, I mean, obviously my painting style is very different than my goals, but I think the hardest thing is, is, is what we said, you know, it's taking what's in here and applying it uh, onto the canvas so that, it, you know, it translates, right? The feeling translates, the energy translates, the, the, the idea translates. Translates. Michael, um, your paintings just, you know, I don't know if the audience realizes that, but they are gigantic. Mm -hmm. So um, when do you decide what size? Yeah, that's a good question. Gonna come out? Um, I, 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 once you told me many years ago when we first met that you were working on a piece that was so large, you didn't know how you were going to get it out of your house. Yeah, well, that, yeah, the studio in Newark, um, I actually had to break the doorway because um, I stretched the paintings. I should have stretched them when I got to the gallery, but I, did, I stretched them there and then I had to break the doorway to get them out. And I had to go, I had to go through the back roof, right? Because it was above my dad's hardware store and then downstairs through the hardware store because it became a process. But I think 
for me, it's, it's, it just depends on like the, the feeling that I get of it. Also the drawings tell a lot, right? So I do preliminary drawings. Um, I'll do st- sketches, but then I do actually charcoal drawings. If I'm not feeling it already in the charcoal stages and it doesn't look a certain way, um, I, I'm already pretty certain that it's not going to turn out to, like the way that I want it. But with the big paintings, like if I get the feeling and I'm like, and I, I don't, what I'll do sometimes is I'll do, you know, kind of mock-ups and then say like, all right, does this deserve to be large, right? Like, what am I trying to say, right? Can I say it in a little painting or do I have to, can I say it in a larger painting, right? So um, yeah, and the ones that I feel like that I've, that I've accomplished and finished are the ones that I feel like are, the, are, are need, needed to be that size, right? So, but it took a while to get there because in the beginning it was more of like, I would do a certain size and then all of a sudden it just popped in my head. I'm like, I want to do a big painting, but it, you know, it took a few years before I felt comfortable enough to, to take on like a, you know, eight, 10 foot painting. Right. So. Mm-hmm. And Peter, would you also like to answer the question that Thomas Gucci uh, asked? It's not about painting, but photography. Um, so what advice would you give to your younger self if you could go back in time and it, and what is the hardest part of creating a, a picture? Um, I think the advice that I would give myself is pretty simple. Don't be afraid to fail. When you're young, you're terrified. You're terrified of failing because you don't want to, you don't want to let your parents down. You don't want to let yourself down. So if I would go back in time, I would just tell myself, just give it up, man. Just do it. Yeah. Just forget so that you're gonna would not have gone into engineering and just gone. Well, I still would have. I, I 100 percent still would have. But but even my engineering was always that, oh my God, am I gonna graduate? That thought, that overwhelming thought of being afraid of failing is something that I would tell myself cut it out, move along. And I think the hardest part for me of photographing anything is what I've uh, stated earlier is I need to be places. I can't photograph things inside of my library, which I am right now. I need to be out in the real world. And sometimes it's not as simple as just being like, okay, I feel like going back to Egypt, which I do because they have a new museum opening up and it should be opening up this year. It's not that simple as that. Sometimes if you go into these foreign countries, um, you could easily be arrested and thrown in jail for spying, which of course you had no intention of doing any such thing. Um, so there's a lot, of, um, a, a lot of things that sometimes you don't even think about that you end up dealing with, and sometimes it's too late. Uh, something as simple as like, where am I gonna stay? Uh, oh, all right, so I'm in a house with no windows, no bed, okay and you have all kinds of mosquitoes flying all over the place. Oh, great, should have thought of this before I came. So a lot of times the problem is never actually photographing the thing, it's getting to the place. It's, yeah. it's, it's you know, coming up with a vision of something that you want to document, but you just can't get there. I was supposed to go to Colombia, um, and what happened, we had a pandemic, and there's nothing I can do about that. So I had to, all the magazines, all the newspapers that I contacted to see if they were interested in it, I, I just can't do anything about it. So I think, I would hate to say that that's an advantage that you two might have, but I, I don't think that's an advantage per se. It's completely different mediums. Um, while you can be, which by the way, I never actually thought how important the size of your pieces. I never thought of that. I never actually thought, does a painter ever, uh, you know, look at themselves and like, okay, do I want to make this five foot or like, you know, some of these gigantic pieces at the Louvre that, you know, spin, uh, you know, 50 feet across. And, and that's the beauty of these kinds of conversations is that as artists, um, we discover a little bit something about what somebody else does. And, you know, being a photographer, like, like I just said, the hardest part is always getting to the place. And sometimes these places are very expensive. I'd love to go to Mozambique. I'd love to, to go to Angola to document some of the places my family lived. But I just can't because it's prohibitively expensive to get there and nobody's going to buy the material. So I would literally be risking, which by the way, I've done many times, an incredible amount of money in the hope that somebody else cares about this. So that's the difficulty. Yeah. 
I just wanted to remind the audience that you can ask questions on Facebook uh, if you are uh, following us on Facebook, or you can you can ask questions here on the Q and A function that we have here on Zoom. So if you want to ask questions to these artists, please do it because we won't be here for long. Uh, yeah, so. Um, I, I have one final question that uh, that I wanted to to ask you all. So, what are your present and future aspirations, and what do you recommend to new artists that are starting? Maybe the question about the artists that are starting is what you already uh, said to your younger self. <laughs> Maybe. I, I guess I'll just go first, since you guys have always been generous generous enough to lay the foundations for me later, right? Um, <laughs> I would literally, you know, just expound on what I said just a few minutes ago is if you have a vision, if you have a dream, if you have a goal, don't let it go. Look at it every single day. When you get up in the morning and you go brush your teeth and you look at the mirror, don't look at your physical self. Look at what that person could be if you just try hard. If you just went out there every single day and you said, I'm going to do my best, not just now, but tomorrow and every other day. And if, the, if you can put something about Portuguese people is that they're determined people. They're hardworking, determined people. And if you have that determination in you, make it happen. There's never been a better life, a better time ever to be a photographer. Let's be real. The simple truth is, as a photojournalist, newspapers are doing worse than they've ever done because the money just isn't there. However, because we live in a very connected world, get your material out there. Make sure everyone sees it. Send emails, send uh, tweets, send everything. And if you're pretty good and your vision has a thread that you can create, that someone can see through it and say like, you know, there's a certain level of quality about this individual, guess what? They're going to call you back. Never give up. Never surrender. Always stick to your vision. Every day you wake up, remind yourself, what is it that you want to accomplish? I'm 52 years old and I still do that. Okay. This is not just me, you know, speaking in, in, you know, perfect terms. This is what I do every single day. I'm never worried about the photograph I took yesterday. I'm terrified about what I'm going to do tomorrow. It's the most important photograph is the one I haven't taken yet. If you think about it that way, you're bound to succeed. I think Peter said it all, uh, but I, I just want to, you know, echo something else he said in a previous comment is don't be afraid to fail. I think that's really important too, um, because out of mistakes, um, new things are created. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to you know, uh, I think to use fear as a tool, right, and to, and to really go um, outside of, of the things you're, you think you're capable of, right, um, even if, if that means you fail at something. Um, and I think aspirations, I mean, I, I, I know we talked about it, um, I think in, in, in uh, previous conversations, but I would love to do work in Portugal. Um, I'd love to get to know more uh, female Portuguese artists, queer Portuguese artists, um, and, and collaborate with them in some ways. So that's one of my goals anyway. What about you, Michael? Uh, in terms of my goals, I, I find that it's just, you know, to keep, to keep painting and to just keep trying to progress my work. Um, you know, I think uh, as time goes on, I find that I'm, I understand it a little bit better, but it's still always a challenge, you know? And so I find if I, I just gonna keep, I just wanna keep progressing, you know, and keep getting the work out there. Uh, and, you know, hopefully it connects with more people. Um, I think that's, that's my, you know, that's what I see for myself in the future. Um, if I had to tell, I usually, cause I, I do teach at times and I tell the students to just be yourself, you know, and to, to kind of set yourself apart, you know, is to always just be honest with who you are. Right. And that's, that's kind of, if you allow that and you're open to that and you see, you'll still see that come out in the work, no matter what type of work you do. Um, yeah. So. Magda, you are on mute. Uh, yeah, we cannot you're... hear you. Sorry. No worries. 
my family is starting to come home. So I, I've been trying to be on mute to not upset. Um, just, you know, we've, Sandra and I have been talking about a little bit about how and where do we take our proud project of the Portuguese American Art Gallery. Obviously, we would like to always call out to more artists, to reach out, to um, get in touch with us, to, you know, again, have no fear and, you know, submit their work. And, but also we've been discussing the possibility of creating some, a bridge for some of the artists that we have been working with. Um, a bridge to Portugal across Atlantic. There are a few artists in Portugal that I've met that have been in the US for residencies or for small short stays. Um, and I think they would also um, welcome that opportunity. So this is Sandra and I and Mina's project for the coming months. Um, and we welcome, of course, suggestions that you all have of what are your wishes and what how we could do this i know it's different for photography you are much more interconnected world um some you know michael you have had exhibits in portugal you have paintings in collections in portugal um but you know so we also encourage those artists that have taken the step that have been across um, to help and support those that are still in the in the process in this journey. Yeah. So I would like to thank you all for being here today and for be accepting to be part of this panel. I think it was a very lively and interesting discussion, and uh, I hope your our audience also enjoyed it. And, um, and thank you, Magda, for being here with me co-hosting this session. And, thank you, Sandra. And thank you for uh, for the audience to 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 listen to what we we were saying here today. Thank, thank you. you, Marina, Peter, and Michael. Also, thank you, thank from you for having us. We really I enjoyed it. Absolutely wonderful. It was a pleasure. Yeah, Sandra and Magda, muito obrigado por esta oportunidade. E um abraço grande a toda a nossa comunidade. Absolutely. Obrigada a todos. Obrigada. Obrigada. Thank you. Bye. All the best.